And that question was, in Proverbs, when someone is called righteous, what does that mean? That word comes up a lot. Well, because I was thinking about this, too, because it was making me nervous. Um, <laughs> I mean, nervous because I was thinking, well, gosh, this seems to contradict Paul. And then I'm like, the eh, Bible's not supposed to contradict itself. Uh -huh. So if the Bible doesn't contradict itself, there must be more poured into this word in Proverbs than you see. Yeah. So I was thinking of Abraham um, believing yeah. and being credited to him as righteous. So there's that imputed thing going on there. Right. And it must be contained in this word. Yes. We just don't see it real clearly. Yeah. So the, the funny thing is that Right now, it takes us an extra jump or a little outside of the book of Proverbs research to understand that context, because in our context, what does righteous mean? It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's amity with God because of somebody else. It's external to us. Well, right. But it, when we first read righteous, when we talk about righteous in terms of doing things, what do we think? Well, it, it does not mean always correct, or, you know, but it does mean... Uh, you're always striving to do God's will. Right. So in the context of Proverbs, then uh, the good, a good place to look is back to Abraham, right? So the, the, what we want to know is what is sort of the Old Testament idea of the word righteous. And we ran into this a little bit with Job as well, right? That uh, Job was righteous and blameless. And it became clear if you keep reading Job, it wasn't that he was not a sinner. He did sin. So what does that mean? And, and so we go to Abraham and what was counted to Abraham as righteous? By what, what means was he counted righteous? His faith, right? And so righteous refers to the person of faith who is striving to live according to the law of God. This was, I mean, this was the basic theme of the Old Testament reading today. Yes. Right? That's right. what it seemed to me. Yes. It's all about that. Right? Exactly. Turn, turn from your unrighteousness. Right. Right? It doesn't mean be perfect. It just means... Right, try to live. And, it, and at its root, it's only secondarily about like the good things you do. It's more about the root that causes those things to happen. Right? So the person who is a wicked person isn't a believer who does something wrong. A wicked person is somebody who actively opposes what God wants to do in the world. Who's someone who doesn't believe in God. Right? And the righteous are those who believe in God and are striving to live according to his precepts and laws. So that kind of helps make sense of some of the things in here where it seems like, as Janine pointed out, it's saying that you got to do certain things in order to be righteous. Um, and we put that in the context of what the scriptures, and especially in the Old Testament, the context for the people reading that would be, um, uh, would be that it is about the faith in God and the desire to do his will rather than perfectly carrying it out. So I thought for me that made helped make a lot of sense of some of the things we read from chapters 10 and 19. Okay. Uh, second question, and I put some references here uh, for you to look at if, uh, if you didn't have time to read it all or if you can't remember things on a dime. Like me. Um, <clears throat> well, as in I can't remember. Uh, where, is the, where is wisdom often found in Proverbs? Parents. Okay, a godly advice. Uh, parents was one. What are those? Both those answers going to have in common? Uh, fear of the Lord, yes. But I'm actually looking for like what I mean. Where is it found? I mean, sort of like where is it actually found? Huh? Uh, yes. Yeah. Outside of us. Yes. Wisdom. When wisdom is described in the Proverbs, it's never seen as some sort of thing you gain from inside yourself. It's always something that lives within the community of those who follow God. Right. Um, so you may become someone who is wise, but the way that you become wise is through counsel of others through the collective wisdom of those following God, right? um, and all those different things. Because one of the things that really stuck out to me as I was reading all these chapters in succession is the number of times 
essentially the same proverb is repeated, right? If you are not willing to listen to reproof or rebuke, you are a fool. The wise has many counselors, has many advisors, right? And so there's this consistent theme that wisdom is not existing within one person, right? It's outside of us. It's applied to us from the community of believers, and which, which means that ultimately it sources what? God, right? I just want to be here on behalf of all husbands to thank our wives for giving us so many opportunities for wisdom. <laughs> On a daily basis. For the recording, that was Mike Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was just struck by, as I was reading those themes, how countercultural that is, especially in our culture, right? Everything in our culture is about the self and all the stuff that exists within the self at the expense of everything around. And this is the opposite, right? That, it's saying that the self is not the place you go for guidance. The self is actually the place of folly that needs to be trained and curbed by God. And one of the ways he does that is through wisdom in his worshiping community, the wisdom of the righteous, right? And as, as Pete brought us back to when we talked about last week, the root of that, again, that's emphasized most often in the problems is all back to the fear of the Lord. So in other words, the Christian counseling shouldn't have any self-help groups that you don't have God help groups. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's why in our churches you don't hear self-help stuff. That's why we don't talk in those sort of languages. Not that we don't think people have a part to play in that process, but it's not generated by them. It comes from outside of themselves, right? So that, that fancy Latin phrase I say sometimes, just so you know, I went to school for stuff. Extra nos, right? Our salvation is outside of ourselves. It is right? the whole term, though, self-help actually an oxymoron because yeah it, it, you're getting the ideas from external and you're just right. working on yourself so i'm not sure that it's totally inconsistent it, it, well, right. we but do it, because we we do talk about in 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 christian circles turn away from your unrighteousness which right. is you know self-help in, in a way just understanding where it's coming from I suppose. yeah you know. and, and i mean I agree with you that often we we think that we're the source of things that we really aren't, right? And so our language reflects this idea that like, well, I'm the one who's responsible for this, and then the collective wisdom of the Christian community says, well, actually, you're not, right? God is, right? Uh, so even because for a long time I really struggled with the like, well, I can I can buy that I don't need to work all these other things in order to be loved by God, but it, it sounds like I at least need to repent, yeah. like I have to at least do that. Um, and then the scriptures and the wisdom of the, the community of believers uh, informed me and, and taught me that even that is not something that you're generating. Right? It's a response to God's word. Right? It's because a, it's, if, it's the discipline that is being talked about, especially I think at 10 and 11, it was early on in the, in the reading. Um, there, it, the practices seem like a, a discipline like you're putting shoe leather to god's wisdom and and doing it right right and there's so even the, like the word discipline means you're a learner you're a student you're you're right. learning from someone right else you should right. you should copyright that's a great turn of the phrase what's that put shoe leather to god's wisdom that's a good one yeah, yeah. yeah. right that's a such a good way to refer to it. Yeah, totally. Well, and, and it's and it really is kind of a, it's a that's why I love the, the the tree bearing fruit imagery, right? It's not that the tree doesn't have a part in the bearing of the fruit, but it's not the source of where the fruit comes from, right? It needs the it needs the nourishment and the care, which all comes from outside of the tree. The tree doesn't generate its own water. It doesn't generate its own nutrients. And so, like the so so because that is a difficult thing to talk about because philosophy. Philosophically speaking, you're like, well, if I have to repent, then that means that I have to make this choice. And so then people get really confused about, does that mean that, that I have to make the initial move? And our understanding is, no, you're not making the initial move. God is making the initial move because you wouldn't even know where you're turning away from or to until his word comes to play, right? And so when you hear that word, that is like, that's why I like to the gospel reading that Jesus as the vine dresser is essentially saying, like, don't cut it down yet. Let me dig up the soil and, and fertilize it 
And he's referring there in the, in the sort of specific interpretation of that parable to his work on the cross, right? The, the great gospel act of deliverance. And in, in so doing, then that allows for the repentance to take place. Um, so the appearances and the language, as you point out, can, can get confused sometimes. All right, let's look at Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6. What is the law gospel analysis of that one? Somebody want to know who has got it there in front of them want to read it for us? All right, go ahead, Ron. Yeah, but that type is really small, B. My steadfast. 16.6. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. By the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. All right, so that's actually what we were just talking about. It's kind of a nice segue into that verse, right? By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for, and by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. So are we doing something in that in that verse there? Yeah, the, the law part is the uh, turning away from evil. Right, yeah, we're the one that's turning away. But what is the root that causes that action? It's it's passive. The fear of the Lord. Right? But atonement is provided. It's 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 passive to us. Right. Somebody right. else is doing that atonement. Right. Well, so this is where, like we talked about last time, that the fear of the Lord really means fear of the Lord. It's not just reverential law, it's it's terror, right? And the first part of this informs us as to why it's no longer just terror. Right? Is that the atonement has been made. Right, and so now our standing has changed in the eyes of God because of the work of Jesus. And so we still have a fear of God in the sense that he's God, and he's far greater than we can imagine. But now that fear is no longer one of judgment and eternal damnation. Right? Um, now that's like something we know he's going to do. And so we have an urgency for the people that we might think are going to suffer that fate. And so we bring, we bring Jesus to them just like he was brought to us. But um, this kind of changes the game. But I think it highlights nicely this relationship we have with God where he does something and then he brings his word to us about that something and that prompts us to turn away from what we've been doing. And without that, there is no repenting. So repenting like wisdom is not something that you've generated. It's not a rational choice you've made within yourself because we don't make that choice without Jesus, without God's intervention. Yeah. Well, so reading, I mean, if you read like five and six and, and onward, like, I mean, in general, I read these as, as exhortations, right? They're exhorting certain behaviors or condemning certain behaviors. So I think you're saying we can certainly attribute steadfast love and faithfulness uh, in, in, in the atonement that you're attributing to God. But I mean, isn't this also meant to be Hey, when you're, you know, if you act in this way, if you act out of love and faithfulness, then that's, you know, we could be in that position, maybe more indirect. Uh, maybe. I mean, when you're talking about, when you're talking with somebody individually, it's pretty much never true. So if I'm talking to you individually, this is always going to be a passive reference of comfort that this work is done on your behalf, which is why it's in the passive tense even though the context of this is a father talking to his son, right? So the assurance here is that, like, your iniquity is not atoned for by you, right? So, I mean, that, so, like, the fact that it points to Jesus is just the, that the, what you're talking about is reflective of the nature of God, which is on display most aptly in the work of Christ on the cross. It's not that that's the only place it happens. Now that you have the new spirit of God in you, we carry these things out through the work of his Holy Spirit, right? So we are a part of it in that sense. But when you're, whenever you're speaking to somebody individually, or when I'm speaking to somebody as a, as a pastor individually, I, I don't think I've ever come into a conversation with an individual and said, like, by your steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity will be atoned for, because that's works righteousness. Well, yeah, but some of this is... So maybe I'm not really understanding what you're saying. Well, I mean, I, I get the point, but I mean, if in a synagogue, they would probably not be preaching that, right? I mean, their concept of atonement... Our concept of atonement is much more developed. 
with Jesus, right? As a very specific God, you know, led thing. And here, I mean, it, like if you read five before, right? It says, everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. So, okay, that's one side. And then, you know, I, I read these as a flow. So then it says, by steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. And it's, it's the and. Some of them are contrasting, right? It's like, oh, well, there's the bad and the good. And this one's an and. And so, I mean, not that, that, that that's incorrect, but just can't you also read it as a very practical statement that says, hey, if you are loving and faithful, then people will forgive you generally, right? I mean, is that, is that really outside of how you would interpret that? Um, no, but I guess I don't see the point of the distinction. Because part of what you're saying buys into the idea that God's nature has changed between the Old Testament and the New Testament. They're saved, by, they're saved by the same Jesus, the same promise, the same gospel as we are. Now, they were saved in, the, in a way in the same sense that we are. Like, have you met Jesus? Did you witness his crucifixion? No. Did they? No. No. I mean, they... Right? And so their faith is in the promise of God that this is the way he's going to handle things. So, like, I agree with you, but I don't, I mean, the, I don't know what this, well, the, what is exactly purpose of the I mean, about the Old Testament part of it, I mean, I guess I'm just saying, a more like Jewish way of looking at it is probably law, right? Most of this is it's law. It's like act, this is how we one ought to act. And now with our uh, revelation of the New Testament and Jesus, we read a lot of gospel in there, which is totally correct. But can it have both, you know, a, a personal application for yeah. behavior? I mean, and, I think it does. And we're not reading gospel in there; it's there, right? That's that's the point of it. It's not a it's not a like time in history where God behaved differently and then he changed what he was doing with Jesus. Right. right? So we believe that all of scripture points to Christ. That's why that's why it's in the book. Right. That's one of the that's one of the criteria for here. So like I agree with, I I think if I understand you correctly, that what you're saying is true. And then it's still grounded in the root of God in the next phrase, and by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. Because what you would be describing is the act of turning away from evil to be one of the righteous, the one who follows God, right? And if you do these things, then if you wrong someone by that conduct, the, the iniquity would be atoned for. But in an ultimate sense, that's never true. So like they, in this time, they would have a temple right that atones for iniquity. So just going to the person you wronged and, and treating them nicely and asking for their forgiveness is not going to do the atoning. We can do that now because Christ was a sacrifice once for all. The, the sin is ultimately atoned for, but at that time, it would have been a rite in the temple where you go and you sacrifice and the price of blood is paid to atone for the iniquity and sin. In the, Does in, that make in sense? That, in even the, in that atonement, it is God who is actually atoning but he's showing mankind that because sin causes death, something had to, to die for your Yeah, I, I don't but think he's disagreeing with that. Yeah, I think he's just, uh, he's just asking about the practical side. But the point is, it's still God's love that is providing the atonement. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. That are providing the system for atonement. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the mercy and the love is that, that he's not requiring that of you. It, 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 right. the, the, the by steadfast love and faithfulness, that's, that's, that's me. It's by his right. Yeah, if I understood Cooper correctly, he was just saying, would that also have been taught as like that's been done, and now if you live according to that, these things will not come back on you the way that they would otherwise do. Right. Is that what you're right? Yeah, right. And I think that's true, but I think the 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 important distinction because our nature is always to try and find the truth in ourselves is to to even that is rooted in god that the ultimate like atonement can never just occur between human beings right that there's action outside well yeah. yeah yeah even the concept of love right i mean clearly these are <laughs> right it's a, it's a divine attribute that, that it's not coming from our yeah i think that would be a, i think that would be a correct application of this text as well is, is the practical side of things especially in the context of conversation between the father and son as you would you would bring that in as a reflection of of God, right? This is the way God has designed us. We're we're a little bit broken, 
And, and so we don't know when to do this, but when we do, things go well because this is the way it was meant to be. And, and we get our cue from that and our ability to do that. Solomon's father, when he did that, that grievous sin, when he repented in Psalm 51, against you and you alone, Lord, I have sinned. Even and, and I love the debates people have on that. But didn't he sin against Uriah and Bishop? Well, yes. But you're talking about the perfect atonement, and, and that has to be right with God. Well, there, so this is where, so I think I talked a little bit about the two kinds of righteousness in here. Uh, and this applies a little bit to this as well, where you have, like before God, we're all the same boat. Zero righteousness, dead in sin. Right? Even if you just lied or you're a murderer or whatever, right? There's no distinction made between us and God. Now, between each other, there's a massive distinction made between lying to your friend and murdering, right? One of them doesn't end up in a court and the other one does. One doesn't end up in jail and the other one does, as it should, right? Um, in the same with atonement, there's two realms to atonement because of that, right? That if you wrong a friend in the realm of, of God, and us, who have you wronged, your friend or God? <laughs> so, right? So just going and apologizing to your friend deals with the atonement that you've wronged them, but it doesn't deal with the atonement of you wronging God because you've disobeyed him in the way that you treated another person. Now, who's the one who deals with that atonement? No, I can't. God does, right? And who, who does it on my behalf? Well, my repentance between me and God will do no good unless something else happens first. Jesus, right? Jesus has to die on the cross because by steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. Right? So there's like two realms at play here, um, and that maybe helps clarify some of those distinctions. Um, okay, number four. Is it good to be rich according to Proverbs? Yes. It's always good to be rich. <laughs> it depends. It depends. It depends. It depends. <laughs> what do you mean by it depends? <laughs> it depends on how you live, right? Yeah. So the, the, I just found it interesting because sort of even more so than I anticipated, I didn't like reading that sometimes, mm -hmm. even though I don't believe that by being rich, you're automatically evil. It's just such a repeated mantra in our culture that when I read like, like positive things, like directly stated positive things about being rich. My the old Adam, he was like, uh, I don't know, I like that, right? And so that's like I, I asked that question, and I gave you some examples there to look at, because there are times where riches are described as good, and they're also described as not so good, right? So it depends on whether you are. We go back again to one of the righteous or one of the wicked, because if the wicked has lots of riches, what are they to use it for? Right, right. And if you're one of the righteous, one of the striving uh, after God, what are you going to use the riches for? Good, right? According to the wisdom of God and such. Right? So, which is, a, by the way, any of you are thinking about that, that's a much more realistic and healthy way of viewing wealth and riches, right? Um, because then you don't think that, well, somebody else has more than me. That means that they did something to take it from me, right? So, that, that's one. One way, one track that you don't have regard. The other is that because uh, I actually I remembered my my high school graduation. The guy who came and spoke was an alumni who had started his own chemical company and was very successful and well. And then what he his his sort of repeated rhetorical thread in his speech was spend the money. Okay, but what he was saying about spending the money was like he had moved his family from a very good neighborhood to a very poor neighborhood and started a free education program for trades for the kids of that neighborhood, right? And then he would say, again, yeah, spend the money, right? And so what was, his, what was his lesson there? Is that money is another one of those blessings from God that are meant to be used in his service and in the service of others according to what he, what he commands, right? And there were numerous of my classmates that totally missed that. And they just thought he was some rich guy that was saying, spend the money. They're like, well, what if you don't have it? Like you, you missed it. You missed the whole thing, <laughs> right? Um, so, and that's a that's that's a very counter counter point of wisdom in proverbs from our culture, right? That that riches are just things, and they can be good or or bad depending on 
who is the one using them and then what, what, what way they use them. Now, of course, we also have the nice umbrella that God is gracious and merciful and he works through broken things all the time. So even if somebody who has wealth and riches isn't a believer, God still works good through the things they do, right? which is important for us to acknowledge. That's like a nice little bridge and conversation for people too. Um, that, like, and that goes back to that two kinds of righteousness, right? Can they do good things for other people even if they, they don't believe in God? Yeah, right? And we want them to be connected to God so that they become good things in his name, right? And they become ultimate good things, right? Um, okay, question number five. What is one, and I think I'm going to, just so you're prepared for this, I think I'm going to have some iteration of this question every time. Um, what is one modern day application you took away from Proverbs 10 to 19? And I put mine on there too. So uh, just as an example, I'll do mine first. So if you turn to Proverbs chapter 17, 27 to 28, whoever restrains his words has knowledge and he who is a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. <laughs> now that's a particular temptation in my job because most of the time people don't need to get answers about things and it can be very tempting to just flap my gums constantly even when i maybe shouldn't maybe i don't have the answer so one modern day application of that for me is making sure to remind myself you don't have all the answers you know, and it's okay if somebody asks you something and you don't know say I don't know. I'll have to look that up and get back to you. Or I'm not sure. I've never thought about that before. That's a great question. Right? Um, so what's one modern day application for Proverbs 10 and 19 for you? Maybe it's something for you personally or something now you decide that I think I want to teach my kids this a different way or talk about it differently with my husband or wife. Be patient and look for reproof. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. Be patient and look for reproof. So standard worldly wisdom is Avoid reproof like it's the worst thing in the world. Rather, now we understand from Proverbs that it's good for one who wants to be wise. Right. Uh, Janine and then Rob. I thought of intentionality, that it's not enough to just bob along and be buffeted about, that you need to be intentional in what you think, in what you believe, and in what you do. And that was sort of tied with the discipline and discipleship uh, that I saw, especially the earlier sections of what we read. Right. Yeah, and that's, a, I think, a particular one for Lutherans that we can, like, we need to make sure we remember to say, like, I can say you should go and do this without making the claim that that is somehow going to save you. It's still something you ought to do because Jesus says you should do it. So do it, right? Um, so, yeah, I agree with you. That's, that's something that's hit me a couple of times for when I'm preparing some sermons. Better for me to keep my mouth shut and have people think I'm an idiot and to open my mouth and remove <laughs> it. <laughs> you, you okay. I think it went more serious. That was similar to mine. That's, yeah. <laughs> But uh, eight, maybe 18 for a verse two is what you're thinking of. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. <laughs> wow. And I actually, particularly, I thought about those in the context of social media. That social media has made the the taming of the tongue even more difficult because it gives you a supposedly safe place where you don't have to you don't have to get anyone's counsel you don't have to think about any consequences at least they don't seem like you need to um, and you can just you put it out there and now not only that but you're not just speaking into like a room of twenty people it's like everybody right um, and so that becomes even more important and I was thinking in the context of family ministry like that's something when I have kids like. We're going to read that and we're going to talk about social media in the context of that. Right. Um, there are many verses um, talking about how a good wife is considered more precious than, than it is. Um, I got one here. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who brings shame is like rotten to his bones. Anyone who has a wife who has lifted her husband up is exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, you know, practically speaking in modern day terms, then what's more important between your job and your wife and, and all those sorts of things that easily get priorities get a little mixed up there at times, right? And, and I was thinking as I was reading that, I think it was actually that verse in particular, 
uh, for the ladies in the room. The reason it's phrased that way is not that it's not true in reverse, but that it's a father talking to the son. So that's why he's talking about it in that sense, just in order to clear up any potential confusion. Um, so that doesn't only apply one direction. <laughs> so really, no. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Modern day, modern day application of what they read. Huh? Sorry, I was just, I, I have never heard that bi-directional relationship. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Just I mean, so usually the nature of what's ascribed to husband and, and, and wife is reciprocal, but it's not the same, which is usually the confusion. Culture usually says it's the nature of that reciprocity is the exact same, which isn't the case, but it's there. It is expected of the back and forth is expected for the blessing of each other. All right, so whenever I do the, whenever we do the readings going forward, I'm always going to have some sort of application question, because part of the reason that God gave you his word is so that it can be beneficial for wisdom and the building up of knowledge uh, according to, to his precepts, right? So uh, be thinking about it, particularly in Proverbs, right? That's Proverbs is like, well, like it's wisdom to not keep to yourself, right? Because wisdom isn't found in you, but in the collective community of the righteous. Okay. All righty. Now we're going to baptism. So take out your other hand out there. Why well, is any any questions? Last questions about the proper reading before we come down. Oh, I always forget to do Thank you. How far should we go this week? We typically do uh, ten, but I think we just do twenty to twenty-eight or twenty-nine. I mean. Yeah, let's do 20 to 29. So for next week, read Proverbs chapter 20 through chapter 29. Um, and we'll do the similar kind of questions. Thank you, Maggie. Okay, baptism. So we're starting at the uh, top of the back of your baptism handouts. Okay. Because we started talking a little bit last week about like, why should one be baptized? And we talked about how people have a tendency to find odd hypotheticals in a vacuum to support the idea that you don't need to get baptized in order to be saved, which is technically true, right? All that saves is faith in Christ, right? The people on the cross attest to that. But it doesn't then follow that you should not get baptized, right? Because who commands that you baptize? Jesus does, right? And so that's the work, that's part of the work of the church. It's part of his intended blessing in the world via the church. One of the means of grace, right, is, is baptism. So if there's a situation where um, like a baby is born and before before somebody can get there to baptize or before the parents can baptize, the baby dies tragically. If mom and dad had been reading God's word and going to church while mom was pregnant. We know that the Holy Spirit can be received by a baby in the womb, because who receives the Holy Spirit in the womb in the Bible? John the Baptist does, right? As soon as Mary speaks, he leaves in the womb, right? In response to the presence of God, the presence of Jesus. So then in that case, I can, as a pastor, assure them that we can trust in the love and, and promises of God through the word that not only you have been hearing, but your unborn child have. Um, but... If I have an opportunity to get my butt to the hospital and baptize that in that time of crisis, I can even more strongly point to that truth. And so the fact that it's not absolutely necessary doesn't then follow that we shouldn't try and do it with a sense of urgency, right? So I had a family at my previous congregation that I baptized their son in the hospital room out of a plastic bowl that I filled up in the sink. Is that a real baptism? Yeah. Heck yeah, it is, right? And he wasn't having any health issues or anything, thankfully. They just wanted to get it done right there. I said, okay, we'll do that. And then we'll just do a little public recognition when you're well enough to come to church. Right? Because there's no reason not to. Just like the Ethiopian eunuch's response to Philip sharing God's words. Is there any reason I can't be baptized right now? It's like, well, there's water, so no. Right? And so that is the sort of joy and urgency we want to have about baptism while still acknowledging that God that saving faith is the thing that saves you in, in Jesus, right? Um, so we talked a little about how sometimes it seems like we get a little confused there when we talk about that, that if it's not necessary, then we don't need to do it. 
well, Jesus commanded it, so we need to do it. Right? Um, just extra gospel reinforcement. Okay, so open up your Bibles to Matthew 28, starting at verse 16. Somebody want to read 28, verses 16 through 20 for us? Here. All right, Ron, go for it. Starting in verse 16. Then. Yep. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. All right, thank you. So, who is to be baptized according to those verses? Everyone. Everyone. No qualification. No qualification. Right, everyone. So, and what is the context of baptism put in there? It's part of a process to do so. Making disciples, right? It's an element of how the church makes disciples. So that means that as the church, the two main elements of making disciples are baptizing and teaching. Teaching. The communion is, is part of the teaching. It's teaching everything I have community, right? Um, and so... We better make sure that when we're going out being the church, that we don't leave any of those elements out, right? And so the tendency we talked about last time can be that, well, the teaching is really the important thing in the baptism. It's not necessary, so we don't have to be so urgent about that. Um, and Jesus disagrees. And when Jesus disagrees, you lose. <laughs> so. Okay, uh, turn to Luke 18. Pete, can you look up the John 3, 5 to 6 one? And uh, Dave, can you look up the Acts 16 or 15 for us? Somebody have the Luke 18 one? That Jane want to read for us? Uh, 15 through 17. Okay. Then they also brought infants to him that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. Jesus called to them them to him and said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter. Right and then the John. Uh, Jesus answered the question about being born again. He answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water in the spirit, not enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh all right, and then Acts 16, verse. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon her. All right, so a little more specifically than who is to be baptized, some of those verses are addressing uh, infant baptism, which not all Christian denominations practice. Um, it's the orthodox position to do infant baptism. And based on verses like uh, Luke 18, 15 to 17, we also have times in Acts where it says that someone and their whole household are baptized. And with the way that Jesus teaches the ancient world to view children, they would most certainly be a part of households, right? Um, which was not really the case um, in, the, in the sort of standard secular understanding of children. The reason the disciples, the disciples are sort of going the way of the world there. Like, well, children, they're not supposed to be here. Important things are happening. You, you can't contribute anything. Please move. Right. And Jesus is like, excuse me, let them come to me. Right. Um, and so we understand that, that in baptism, that, that is the same. Right? I wonder why it would have been so strange to the disciples, because the, what, the sign and seal that you were part of the community of Israel would have been circumcision. 
Right. And that was certainly an infant kind of thing. But then what becomes the emphasis of the righteous life after circumcision? It's the doing of things, and children aren't very capable. Right? So they become seen as not as not as necessary. Right? Like you would have, it would have been totally weird to have children involved in some of the things that are described in the Old Testament along those lines, right? And, and some of that is because of the Old Covenant and now the New Covenant. But a lot of it also is this calling back from Jesus, like, now we've gotten a little lost along the way here on the way we view children. Right? And so I'm going to remind you where that where that stands, how that works, right? Um, the other reason is in the verse read in John chapter 3, what is the state of all of those verbs in application to the one being born again? Are they, are they, are they borning themselves? Or are they being born? They're being born, right? It's a passive role. So in baptism, you're not doing stuff. And what's the most powerful image of you not doing stuff in baptism? When it's a little tiny baby that's being baptized. Because maybe the only thing the baby's doing is pooping in its diaper and crying. <laughs> which it really has nothing to do with baptism. Right? But it's still a valid baptism and a source of immense comfort because who's doing the work? Yeah. God is doing the work. Right? He's making a commitment of faithfulness to you which is far more valuable than your commitment of faithfulness to him. Because it lasts way longer. Right? So that's one of the reasons that we baptize in this. Right? Uh, and if you, if you believe that baptism is a work of your own doing, a work of your own confession, then it would make sense not to baptize a two-month-old because they can't say English words yet, much less make a cogent confession of faith or any sort of promise to God. Yeah. yeah. So um, just to confirm... Um, when we do infant baptism, it's not saying that the actual baby believes and has faith. Is that well, we so we do say that, but the the faith is being made in them by God. So they're not like like it's not an active faith like for an adult. So if I was doing an adult baptism, the the understanding is still the same that the faith is being created in them by the Holy Spirit. And we would, we would say that commute or. Confirmation would be a public affirmation of faith, not baptism. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Which is why confirmation isn't a sacrament because it's not the work of God. It's your response to God's work in your in your life. Right. So that John three passage about being born again that applies in baptism whether you're three months old or ninety. Right. The, that God is the one doing the work in, regardless of, of what the age is. Right? Um, and that's where its source of comfort is. Because if it was a work of yours, it was an act of your confession, it doesn't provide a lot of comfort because what happens if next week you, you discard God in, a, in an unfavorable situation? Then all of a sudden, in your mind, your baptism is scrapped, which is why if people uh, believe that and they fall away from the church and come back, they want to get another baptism. Yeah. Because in their mind, they're like, well, it clearly didn't take because I stopped believing and I went astray and, and I need a new one. And, and my response to that would be, were, were you baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yeah. Well, welcome home, prodigal son. The, the master of the house is throwing a party for you because you're alive. It was him. He made you a part of his household. You didn't do anything. That's why it's comforting, because then when your life's a total mess, you can say, but I'm a baptized child. Do you, do you think the other Christian faiths look at older baptisms as more of a public affirmation of their I think they do they sort of combine into one because they usually are they usually have a period of instruction preceding that um, so they sort of combine what we do separately uh, and the reason we separate them isn't because we don't think they should be instructed but that the faith is a gift from God and he's given his church a means by which that's good and so that's what we do good question that answer your question um, like, like, I also look at baptism as, uh, like, a way for the church and the LCMS, I, I, I know, um, during a baptism, yeah. the, the members, the people that are there at the yeah. service, basically say that they're going to support and help yeah. raise the yeah. child up yeah. as well, as well as sponsors or, yeah. um, 
God, godparents as well. Yep. Yeah, so it's a recognition by the body of believers that this is now, it would be the same as like if you were adopted into a family, well, all the family by adopting you is saying like, you're one of us now, you're, you're a brother or a sister, and we're going to look out for you. Mm -hmm. This is sort of a spiritual recognition. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons why if, it, if somebody's super worried about being baptized publicly, um, I'll allow them to do it on a different date and then we'll all recognize it in the service. But I really like to do it in the service because that's an important part, I think, for them too, is to recognize like you're you're now a part of this body of Christ here. And, and, and they recognize that too. Uh, and so you, you know, you're not an unimportant person. Uh, yeah. You know, going baptism in the church, it hasn't gone baptism. Huh? So they believe in Jesus. So this is again where we would say that God works even through less than ideal applications of his instructions. He always does. He does that here too. Um, but so we would, we would never go as far to say that like a six-year-old who hasn't been baptized because their church believes that they're not old enough to, to verbally confess their faith is can't receive the Holy Spirit or has it. Right? If, they, if they have said Jesus is Lord, the scriptures say, you can't, you can't say that in truth without possessing the Holy Spirit. We would just say that, like, that this is where I like using the good, better, best. It's not that they're like, oh, all hope is lost. You're totally screwed because you just didn't do this the right way. We are saying it's less than ideal because we'd like to offer you more assurance in the gospel. Right? And so that would be the approach we'd have. Um, so if somebody, so if somebody, like, let's say we have a family join our church coming from that background, and they have a four or five year old who isn't baptized. I would I would talk to them and really encourage them to consider baptism. I would teach them the stuff we're talking about here so they know that like baptism is not a work dependent upon like how cognizant and how rational and how well spoken your child is. Because it's not their commitment to God, it's his commitment to them. Right. Um, and so that would be the approach we would take. Okay, uh, in whose name does baptism take place? What? God, God, God. Yeah, right? And specifically, which name of God? No. The triune name of God. We can't take that for granted because not all Christians believe in the Trinity. So, in the triune name of God, okay? So if somebody comes to me and says they've been baptized in another church and they want to be baptized again, I'll ask them, were you baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? If the answer to that is yes, then I will say, you don't need another baptism. You have been baptized. Right? Um, if they said they were baptized in the name of Larry and Mike Curley, <laughs> then they need a baptism because they weren't baptized. Right? Um, and this, was, this was one of the early controversies in the church because there were people that were concerned when they found out like their pastor or their priest decided he was no longer a believer and he says i haven't been a believer for 10 years and they were well okay well if, if he baptized me in the last 10 years then is my baptism no longer valid because he wasn't a believer and the answer to that was no your baptism is still valid the, the, this is not necessarily unrealistic because the catholic church just went yeah, through exactly. a controversy similar to this involving a, a priest who said the words not exactly correct yeah and they invalidated like all the baptisms and stuff yeah i mean utterly yeah, so, ridiculous. yeah. It, and, and from our perspective we're like what, what? <laughs> right um so if, if like i choke in the middle of saying the word father and, it's, and it comes out as two words we're not like oh, did that one take <laughs> that's, not, that's not the understanding um, and so right it is it is it is a real thing it is a real a, a real uh, concern um, and for us god is doing the work he's given us a formula to say to do and so we do that and then we can assure one another that god has in fact given the gifts he's promised to baptism faith life and the holy spirit we always so, had to ask that question because we were afraid that we had screwed up communion for like a year and a half <laughs> <laughs> But, and that is like so our stance on that stuff and the reason that we're we're so focused on the details isn't because if you get one of them wrong it's all all for naught but because we want to be as faithful as we possibly can um, and so if something happens that we realize like oh my goodness we've been doing something not 
totally correct. We don't, the reaction isn't, oh my goodness, we're all in trouble because we've been doing this wrong. It's, well, let's change what we're doing in order to reflect a more faithful stance to what God has given us. Right? And, then we, and then we just go on, right? Because now, according to Jesus, we no longer live under the condemnation of law. We live in grace, right? That's Luther's whole quote about sin boldly, is not go out and do whatever the heck you want. It's don't let the fear of doing something wrong prevent you from going and doing anything because now you live under the grace of Jesus. So if something like that happens, it's not the end of the world right? because Christ has overcome all. What? Yeah, right, right. Um, okay, and then uh, what does God do in and through his name? So number six, for you Bible scholars out there, something you hear a lot, actually, you hear it every service. Um, that's where we get the blessing at the end of the service. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift, you up, uh, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, right? And the one thing I'll highlight there before we move on is if you look in the scriptures there, so you turn to number six and you look at Lord, Lord is in all caps. In English, when Lord is in all caps, it means Yahweh, the, the formal given name of God. Right? And so the purpose of that blessing then and now is that a spokesperson appointed by God, in the case of number six, it was the high priest Aaron. Now in, in our day and age, it's the pastor who's been called to serve at congregation, speaks the name of God upon his people as a blessing. Okay? That's one of the reasons when I got here, we stopped saying it together. Because you don't say the blessings together. right? A blessing is something you receive. So it'd be weird if somebody was like, I'm going to bless you, and then you try to like say the same words with them as they were doing. That's not the way that interaction goes, right? Because if you do that, you're missing the reception of the blessing, right? Um, and so that's where that comes from, and that's why, right? So the name of God, it wasn't just, it didn't just start with baptism, the name. God has been putting his name on his people for a long time, right? Which I think is really cool, because that means even those people in the desert who heard it from Aaron, are tied to you. You're tied to them because you're the people of God who bear his name. Um, okay. Blessings of that over time. Okay. A little over time. Okay. Um, I'm just going to blow through this real quick. Uh, so blessings of baptism. Uh, this talks about the benefits. So we believe it works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death of the devil, and gives eternal salvation for all who believe this. As the words and promises of God declare, and then the words there are Mark 16, 16. We'll talk about that next week. We'll finish up our discussion on baptism um, and get into what we think is happening there because we also don't all agree on that. So, okay. Uh, but we're over time. So let's close with uh, the words. For Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, great study, guys. Have a great week.